Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Show, and you recognize my co-pilot for this week. He's been on a few times. Pete Nakos from On3.com, intrepid reporter, an expert, in my opinion, on NIL and uh, and transfer portal uh, comings and goings. And he's also an expert on something else I want to talk about here in just a second. But Pete Nakos, welcome once again to the Tim May Show, my man. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. And remember, what did I tell you about when you're the co-pilot on this show? You don't touch any of the buttons or grab the or grab the wheel unless you're commanded to by yours truly. I'm just correct? following your lead. I'm just following your lead, Tim. There you go. A trainee pilot, ladies and gentlemen. Now, this guy could fly his own jet fighter at this moment and uh, miss all the clouds. That's one of the great things about flying a jet fighter. You can point at a cloud and go to it. But I digress. Uh, Pete, uh, by the way, going to have a really nice conversation with a former Buckeye former big-time Ohio State wide receiver from 1984 and 85. No, not Chris Carter, but Mike Lanise. He's the guy that made a huge catch against Michigan when it mattered most in 1984, went on to become a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, and just when I, and then just when you thought he was going into politics or something like that, the young man jumped into the military. We're going to talk about that and a lot of other things, but especially his run-in uh, with uh, Nick Saban, Former Alabama coach. Now I can say that. That's hard to say, almost, isn't it, Pete? Yeah, it's it's weird. It's very weird. But former coach at Alabama, back when he was recruiting uh, Mike Lanise from Mayfield Heights, way back when in the uh, in the early early nineteen eighties for Ohio State, before you know Nick Saban got fired by Earl Bruce, ladies and gentlemen. Hard to believe, but it happened. But just his uh, his takes and and really a cool anecdote about Nick Saban visiting his house. Uh, one night and uh, having a bad cold and his mom doing something about it. But uh, I digress. So let's get back to my conversation with Pete Nakos here. Uh, and the reason we're talking more than anything else is Rush Bjork has been, is looks like he's going to be named the next uh, athletic director at the Ohio State University, succeeding Gene Smith, who retires formally. I do believe his last day on the job is June 30th, uh, yep. 2024. But uh, just, First up, I'll give you my take, and then you give me. I mean, I'll, you give me your take, and I'll give you my take, uh, Pete, on the hiring of Mr. Bjork from Texas A&M University, formerly of Ole Miss, uh, formerly of Western Kentucky. Those are the three places he's been the athletic director in his uh, really still kind of young career. But just what's your take on the hiring of Mr. Bjork? Yeah, he's from Illinois. Um, played college football, I think, at the D two or D three level. Um, yeah, I mean, he he was at Ole Miss. He took the Texas A&M job. Um, I think in the last like 20 months or so, Ross has really um, I, I done a really good job with NIL fundraising, I guess 30 months or so. Um, a &M hey, wait, wait. Well, he got it. He got it. He and he and Texas A&M got a shout out from Nick Saban on that, but go ahead now. <laughs> they did. They did. But yeah, I guess in like the last 30 months or so, I think he's played a big role in, in A&M having one of the more forefront NIL uh programs you could say and then the other thing that uh, Ross Bajork is really well known for is his fundraising ability and um, obviously Texas A&M has a really rich donor base um, and he's been able to tap into that now obviously um, there's a lot to dissect there he he's never really worked in the Big Ten very much um, obviously uh, there what happened at Ole Miss, he was sort of a part of. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's a lot to dissect there. Um, I know, Tim, you have some thoughts, and, and I don't think you envisioned this was going to be the hire to come after Gene Smith. No, when I heard that the, the final three or four included uh, Pat Chun from Washington State, a former Ohio State uh, senior associate athletic director, basically uh, Gene Smith's right-hand man uh, for a while up until 2012 when he left to become the Florida Atlantic University uh, athletic director. I think he was there for five, five and a half years, and then left to become Washington State's athletic director. And we all know the travails that Washington State has been through over the last couple of years with the the disintegration of the uh, of the of the Pac-12 conference, and uh, you know just the way he has steered that program and been on several you know, several expert committees in NCAA and things like that. And plus, I go yeah. way back with Pat Chun. I know what an upstanding smart fellow he is, how he cut his teeth at Ohio State, how he became an expert at fundraising along with a lot of other things, helped uh, Gene Smith make some tough decisions way back when, and then moved on in his career and has been on that upward path. And in my opinion, he was on the stairs, the stairs leading 
to this Ohio State job when Gene Smith finally stepped away, and all of a sudden he gets to the landing, and uh, Ross Bjork looks like gets the call. Uh, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with this hiring. I mean, we'll see where it goes. I mean, everybody deserves a chance, et cetera. My opinion, the reason I don't agree with this hiring, uh, if in fact it is going to take place, is because I thought uh, Pat Chun was tailor-made for this job from the standpoint of understanding modern college athletics from both ends of the spectrum. But on top of that, having you know having roots in Ohio, having sowed uh, having sowed his career in the great state of Ohio, and and working at the biggest athletic department in the country, Ohio State, with its myriad sports programs, the importance that is to the fabric of Ohio State and to the really the fabric of Ohio. I thought he understood that as well, if not better than anybody. To me, this uh, just screams loudly because I understand it. Uh, Pat Chun had great backing from the board of trustees, from many members on the board of trustees, from former coaches, present coaches uh, on the Ohio State uh, athletic staff, et cetera. Any, any, almost any, any major MVP or VIP you could talk, you could think of uh, that's concerned with Ohio State athletics. Pretty much, uh, Pat Chun was getting a ringing letter of endorsement the way I understood it. To me, this screams of Ted Carter, the new the new president of Ohio State, stepping out and maybe going his own way. For what reason? Uh, I'm not, it's not clear to me. Uh, every athletic director now has to be involved in fundraising. That's, if you're not involved in that, uh, you know, and be, become an expert at it, especially like at a place like Washington State, uh, then, you, you know, you don't deserve the job in the first place. And uh, like you said, there's some baggage with Ross Bjork that uh, I guess uh, the firm that first uh, highlighted who Ohio State should go after or spotlighted who Ohio State should go after. And then when Ted Carter looked over the list, uh, I guess we'll find out sooner or later what jumped out about Ross Bjork that didn't jump out about Pat Chun, except that one guy's had – little if any involvement with Ohio State University over the last uh, 30 years, that would be Bjork. And one guy has, one guy cut his teeth at Ohio State. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm a Pat Chun guy. I thought Pat Chun was a shoe in for this. I thought this was almost a uh, situation to where they, they did a search, but they come back to Pat Chun, the, who, who was uh, several years ago, became the first Asian American to be named a, an athletic director at, at a power five conference school. You know, other than that, I really have no opinion. <laughs> I, guess, yeah, I guess the one, like the 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 couple of notes I'll add is obviously uh, not a name, as someone pointed out today on social media, not a name I had on the bingo card for the Ohio State job. Um, at the same time, though, if I mean, if you go, are you talking if, about who, Ross Bjork or uh, Ross Pat Bjork? Yeah, 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 Ross Bjork. And, and then the other thing, too, that's probably worth mentioning is with the way college football is set up and these new television contracts and college football playoff expansion, like the big 10 and sec are like further away than everyone else in terms of the amount of money they have, um, the TV deals, the, the amount of talent in their conferences. So yeah. I guess if you look through that lens, uh, this Texas A&M athletic director definitely has the most experience to trying to operate that big of an athletic department. And that's not a shot at Pat Chong, but obviously we all know what's going on on the West coast, the PAC 12 kind of seasoning do exist after this year. Um, so I guess through that lens, it, it could make sense because Ross has definitely managed the size of an athletic department. He's going to be taking over at Ohio state. And um, I mean, we can continue to dissect it in the weeks to come. But the other thing too, is all of a sudden with, if he does take this job and, He's the top target, and they're in discussions. And, um, I mean, all of a sudden, he is one of the leading faces of college sports if he does take correct. this job. Very correct. And, you know, and I'm not holding this. Yeah, I am holding him against it a little bit because he put his put his endorsement on it when he uh, basically they went for that contract extension. You know, he didn't hire Jimbo Fisher at Ole Miss, but he's the one – excuse me, don't, don't mix those two up. He didn't no. hire uh, Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M, but he's the one that gave him the, the – um, that pushed Seven million. The, yeah. yeah, and the big time endorsement, the big time extension on that. That uh, now all of a sudden, uh, middle of this past season, uh, Texas A&M walked away from. Uh, right. You know, there are a lot of people at Texas A&M who weren't that fired up about that extension in the first place uh, after one decent year from Jimbo Fisher, and uh, it's costing Texas A&M a lot of money. And then on top of that, when it comes to fundraising, for example, I grew up in East Texas. 
in Lufkin, Texas. I had friends who went to Texas A&M and, um, and uh, right on down the line. I mean, when it comes to fundraising at like at Texas A&M, it's just a matter of passing the plate. You know, it's not, yeah, not that difficult Fair. to place the fundraise. Go ahead. Yep. No, 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 no. I was just agreeing with you. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a, it's a much different demographic in uh, college station than it is in Columbus. And I mean, obviously, Ohio State is one of the biggest universities with the biggest alumni data, not databases, uh, alumni bases. Um, yeah. But obviously, I, I think just the economics are a little bit different at Texas A&M. You're right about that. Yeah. I mean, I'm just talking about the big the big movers and shakers that pretty much, in essence, behind the scenes kind of run run, run Texas A&M and definitely run the athletic department. And uh, right. so, you know, they got saddled with a tremendous payoff for uh, Jimbo Fisher that's going to be paid out in installments, I guess, you know, yeah. <laughs> over 10 years, eight or 10 years, $7.5 million a year, whatever it is, uh, you know. That was the contract he negotiated for him, and it, in the less than two years, had to walk away from it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he basically said that uh, Jimbo Fisher and the uh, football team were on the right track, and uh, maybe uh, you don't want him running the switchyard at your local train station. That's all I'll say about that. I'm not knocking him. I just thought this was the moment that was tailor-made for Pat Chun uh, – a son of the program, pardon the expression, at Ohio State, who cut his teeth coming all the way up from a, you know, a, an intern or a, an assistant in the sports information department to where he is today, and uh, and really puts has put forth a lot of effort to build his career. Not that Ross Bjork hasn't. Ross Bjork has been interesting places like Western Kentucky and Ole Miss and Texas A and M. He understands the lay of the land in that regard. I just thought, yeah. I just thought there was a deserving guy out there, and the deserving guy didn't get the job and I'm not going to back away from that assessment. Ross Bjork may be, end up being one of the great athletic directors in Ohio state history. There haven't been very many of them, which is uh, interesting about this hire. Uh, but this is definitely Ted Carter putting his imprint immediately on being president of Ohio state and going outside the family to bring in yeah. you know, a new different way of looking at things perhaps, or it's maybe also, just doing it. Maybe just doing it for the fun of it. I have no idea. It's also, I mean, it's it's a clear sign, in my opinion, that Gene Smith didn't have the the final say in this. Correct. I mean, that's that's the easy way of putting it. I would think Gene Smith it feels a little bit uh, maybe not stabbed in the back, but stabbed in the heart about this about this hiring. And if in fact it goes through, we'll yep. see how things go. But anyway, uh, I did want to get your take on that because, um, yeah. SEC and the Pac-12, and you know they're they're both big time playgrounds. But now uh, the the background of having the SEC, maybe knowing some of the secrets of the SEC, right, uh, right. could do Ross Bjork uh, a lot of good. And we all know this is all an NIL game anymore. Uh, how much money's in the war chest, et cetera? Ohio State, uh, we're we're going to talk about that when we come back from my conversation with Michael Neese in a minute. But but uh, Texas A and M was, if not the first, one of the initial. Uh, universities when it became legal, not right. not within the rules when it became legal, ladies and gentlemen. I keep referring you to that to that term because it is legal to have name, image, and likeness deals uh, yep. because the NCAA kicked the can so far down the road that states stepped in and made it legal. But you got to give them credit for the way they mustered the troops, right? Yeah, no, that's for sure. And um, it, it kind of goes back to that point about the the value of NIL and, and Ross Bajork has obviously found success. And I mean, I think Gene Smith's done a nice job of supporting Ohio State in their efforts, but it's clear that, I mean, especially just through Ohio State football, that they're trying to rip up efforts more and more. And um, Ryan Day had the comment about maybe like two years ago about the impact on signing day and stuff. And um, it's become more, more of a priority here in Columbus. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Hey, let's get to, if you give me a second here, Pete, let's get to my conversation uh, with Michael Neese, former Buckeye wide receiver of great repute, went on to become a Rhodes Scholar, as I said earlier, then got into the military. I mean, I I really didn't see that coming from him. As a matter of fact, you, you might hear me uh, reminisce with him about a time when he talked to me about uh, maybe taking some classes at Ohio State uh, down the road, which would uh, prepare me to become his perhaps his spokesman when he when he got into politics, and it was pretty funny. We actually had that conversation. But I've always liked this guy, and you'll see why. Let's get into my conversation with Mike Lanise. 
Man, what a pleasure it is to uh, welcome in this young man, still a young man, Mike Lanise, former superstar Ohio State wide receiver back in the mid-'80s. Uh, played with a guy you may have heard of, too, uh, named Chris Carter. Uh, they were the the golden tandem. The You know, everybody thinks Ohio State just, just invented wide receivers um, here in the last uh, decade or so, but Mike Lanise, you and uh, Chris Carter had it going on there for a while. And by the way, welcome to the Tim May Show. Thank you, Tim. Great to see you again. Uh, I miss you, man. I really do miss oh, you. Um, yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. So, yeah, Chris and I had a, had a good run. Uh, and then he had a much better run, obviously, in the yeah. NFL. I'm not sure what happened to him. Some, someone said he ended up in the Hall of Fame or something. He had a gold jacket for something. But, yeah. Yeah. God bless. But, uh, but it, it's been a while, right? I mean, here's the thing. See, the thing about college football fans is you don't necessarily have to have that a Hall of Fame career to have a, a niche in people's memories. And my memory of you is making that great catch against Michigan back in 1984. I don't know if you remember or not, you know, but, uh, but the bottom line is there were other points. I mean, you were always a leader of the team. Uh, funny how you ended up in, you're in, are you in the military now? Well, how, describe people what you're doing right now. Yeah. So I'm actually in the army reserve. I'm a civil affairs officer uh, in the army reserve and um I've been doing that for about 14, 15 years now. And yep. prior to that, I was I was a, a surface warfare officer in the Navy, active duty Navy uh, in the early 90s. Um, got out, had a long break in service. And then, you know, my wife says I went temporarily insane and joined the Army. So here I am. You needed that extra stipend every month. Uh, I, I know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wait a minute. Not, 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 not the money. Trust me. We don't do it for the money. Dude, surface warfare? Are you kidding me? Would you be over there right now scheming up something over in the uh over so, yeah, that, Yemen? Yeah, that, that was my uh my role. Um, but my ship was actually home ported in, in a place called Subic Bay in the Philippines. So we would be more focused on what is now called the Indo Indo Paycom theater. So um South China Sea, that was our stomping grounds. Uh, and we got we got a chance to get around a little bit, um, saw a lot of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, there are lots of lots of things going on right now. My son is actually in the Navy. Oh no, um, yeah, yeah, and he's a West Coast sailor as well. Uh, and my daughter is in the Marine Corps. So our uh, yeah, I mean we're we're as parents we're we're obviously concerned about um, global it's, events as they are developing. Yeah, I was gonna say, man, Subic Bay. I mean, that's got to be. I mean, whatever. I, with what's going on with China and Taiwan and oh my goodness, I don't know how you sleep at night. Do you sleep at night? Yeah. I mean, it, it's tough when you, it's one thing for me yeah. to, to get into the mix. It's, it's, it's entirely different, you know, for, for my, my kids and, and my wife is prior service as well. Yeah. You know, so we, we understand that life. We understand that world. Um, when you're young, you don't, you don't get it. I mean, you don't really understand the, uh, the enormity of what you're getting into and, and the potential um, circumstances in which you might, you might find yourself. And yeah. I was so, going to say, th this is kind of like a game of, was it, uh, what was it where you go around smashing the little frogs when they pop their heads up? I mean, that's what global affairs yeah. are now. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, well, you know, good for you and good for your family. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I got to know this guy pretty well. I, I, as, as often as I could ever talk to him, when he when I first started covering Ohio State in 1984, I talked to Mike Lanise because he was always smart. He always gave great answers. Matter of fact, you don't remember this, but Ralph, Ralph Moschenko missed a uh, field goal attempt on the last play of the game at Michigan State back in 1984. And my lead in my story the next day was uh, when it came to that, it wasn't so much Ohio State dodged a bullet as the bullet dodged them. You know, <laughs> and uh, but I remember you saying after that game. When y'all when y'all end up in the when y'all end up winning the Big Ten and going to the Rose Bowl, nobody's gonna remember how close this game was. Just gonna remember we won the game, right? And uh, I don't know if you remember, but I remember that like it happened five minutes ago. I think it was in that in that stupid uh, uh, steam boiler room that was the interview room uh, there in the old uh, the old setup for Michigan Spartan Stadium. But uh, Mike, even back then, all that mattered was winning, right? And as I pointed out to people, that team in '84 will go down in history is the only team that won the big 10 outright before you, before the playoff era started, you know, with two losses in the league and still won it outright. I mean, that was a, that, 
on many ways, that was a snake bit team and a chosen team at the same time, wasn't it? Yeah. I, I mean, and, and you got to bear with me. You know, I got hit, hit in the head a lot as a kid. So I don't remember a lot of the things that you probably remember. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you I, had I do a lot remember, of moments. Yeah. Go ahead. I do remember that that team. And, you know, I, I don't know the exact number, but I think like at least 80 percent of our starting offense and, and a big chunk of our starting defense ended up playing in the NFL for oh, yeah. a long time. Yeah. You know, guys like Laudermilk, Lachey, Keith, Spielman, you know, William White, William all White. those guys. Yeah. yeah. You know, they all ended up playing. Tom Zach. I mean, Tom yeah. Zach played for 15 years. Yeah, 40, yeah. same like for every time I saw him, he was with a different team, but yeah, getting paid, getting paid. And he's, you know, he got that pension going. So, um, you know, we had incredible talent and you said, like, we were snake bit a couple of times and, you know, that's probably the most of my looking back at my athletic career as, as short as it was, um, you know, that's the thing that bothers me the most that we didn't end up winning the national championship. Cause that was a, that was a national championship team in terms of talent. Yeah, yeah. In eighty five, the eighty five team just got snake bit. Y'all y'all had everybody coming back, so many guys coming back, and then Keith breaks his you know, breaks a bone in his foot, you know, before the season opened. I was back that was back when the season started in the middle of September, by the way. Uh yeah. but uh, you know, right on down the line, it just uh, it wasn't it wasn't meant to be, you know what I mean? And there's a lot of Ohio State teams like that that got that close. I wanted to ask you this though. What I'm gonna get to is you're a man with credentials when it came to playing football, playing wide receiver. Uh, are you amazed to a certain extent by what Ohio State has going on in that realm uh, the last decade or so, the players they're they're pumping out into the National Football League? And, you know, you've seen – you've gotten – if either watch on television or live. Matter of fact, I think you said you went to your first live game here, uh, what, uh, this year in like the first 10 – in the last 10 or 15 years, right? But yeah. you're keeping up with it to a certain extent, I would think. It's your alma mater, but uh, – is it amazing what Ohio State's been pumping out offensively? Yeah, and you know that's a testament, obviously, to recruiting. You got you got to have the genetics to be you know to be playing at that level anymore. Yeah, um, and, and it's a testament to the coaching. I mean, Brian Hartline is doing a terrific job. I don't know him that well. I met him a couple of times back in the day, and he had a, a great career uh, in the NFL. Great career, obviously, at Ohio State. Um, but you know, there's a lot to learn at that position, especially now. Be back when we played, you know. We, we had to block, right? Yeah. I mean, we ran the ball a lot. Uh, and, you know, we didn't have the sophisticated passing schemes that they do today. And so we had to kind of split our time a little bit. Um, what these guys do, I mean, it's a full-time – I mean, look look at my situation. I came in as a running back, right? I was yes. a tailback out of uh, out of Mayfield, Ohio. I'll give Mayfield a plug, all my, all my homeboys and girls back there. Named um, after but, me. Named after me, Mayfield. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, I, I wanted to play tailback in, in college. And obviously I was delusional because I was, you know, 185 pounds. Um, and after my, I guess, sophomore year, um, maybe my freshman year, I ended up making the switch to, to flanker. Uh, and I, I never got hit again, which is good. Uh, but you know, the things that, that they're doing today are are so much more sophisticated and complex than the things we were doing back then. I mean, ultimately, yeah, you know, it's all about running, you know, running running good routes and catching the football. But but the schemes that they have are so much more complicated. I mean, I, I was telling somebody the other day, I mean, if I played today, you know, I'd probably be playing in the, in the slot in a spread, right? And yeah, I'd be catching 150 balls a year yeah. in the slot. Uh, and especially with a guy like Chris taking up, all the oxygen on the on the other side of the field, you know, would leave that middle open, and I I would just be in uh, like a, like I would be a hog heaven. I mean, it, it, there would be a, a perfect situation for me. Yeah. Uh, not to not to mention you know the the nil money, but yes. um, that, that would be nice as well. <laughs> yeah, I was going I was going you know you look at it now, man. You look back at that team in '84, and like you saw, like you talked about. Y'all were talent laden, is, a, is the term I like to use. Star mm -hmm. laden. Uh, just think what kind of NIL stuff would have been going on. I mean, uh, could have been going on, might have already been going on, but I mean, legally going on. I'm just joking with you. To a yeah, certain no. And, but I mean, yeah, it's I, crazy, I, isn't it? I mean, uh, go ahead. You can't relive the past, but no, wow. you can't. And, and, you know, to, to our credit, and, you know, it's not a hundred percent certain, but, 
we were a clean football program. Yeah. And I don't care what anybody says. I mean, yeah. there might have been individual instances, minor instances, minor infractions here and there. But overall, we were a very clean football program. And, yeah, it was just different back then. There wasn't so much money washing around the program. Um, the coaches weren't paid that much money. The athletic directors weren't paid that much. The trainers weren't paid but very much money. No yeah. one made a lot of money doing this thing. You didn't have seat licenses. You didn't have autographs going for sale for thousands of dollars. You know, none of that stuff existed. Yeah, it was it was about as pure as you can get up until the nineties to you know to real amateur athletics. And then in the nineties, I, I always kind of use that that era in the mid nineties where they initiated seat licenses in collegiate football. For the yeah. first time, right? Yeah, I yeah. think seat licenses. It might have might not have been the the cause of what we see today, but it was certainly an indicator of where we were headed. Yeah, and and now, you know, once once coaches started to sign million dollar contracts, um, things got very different. And you know, there was a point at which everyone was getting paid. Everybody was getting paid. the The head coach, the assistant coaches, the trainers, the 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 strength coaches were getting paid a bunch of money. Yeah, you know. Yeah. The athletic the athletic directors were getting paid a ton of money. Everyone yeah. was getting paid except for the kids. Yeah. And, and that was that was a scandal. I mean, the shame is is always and forever going to be on the NCAA side, you know, with regard to what I would call basic issues of fairness and compassion. Right. There were kids that were struggling, and you know, I came from the east side of Mayfield, or east side of Cleveland, a place called Mayfield. Um, you know, a, a normal suburban environment. But, you know, when I got to college, I started to see that kids came from very, very different environments compared to what I came from. Yeah. And they struggled. I mean, you know, inner inner city Detroit, you know, Akron, uh, they had very different stories from the stories that I had growing up. And to, to deny these kids essentials that, that you know, that everyone would would normally associate with a, a regular normal college experience, um, you know, outside of athletics, it, it, it's, it's shameful. That, that's the only word I can think of it. And yeah. that it took this long for the NCAA to to acquiesce, really, really to capitulate. I mean, yeah, they they still they still fought it tooth and nail, and you know, as they were all getting paid, and they and they were denying these kids. You know, a, a basic allowance for subsistence. That, yeah. That's what I, what I would call it. Yeah. I mean, dude, they could have worked this out 20, 30 years ago, like you're Easily. talking about. Easily. It's, it, and it's shameful. It is shameful it is. the way they handle it. Yeah. As I said, they kept kicking the can. They kicked the can so far down the road about letting uh, athletes share in the largesse till all of a sudden now somebody else is paying them. You know what I mean? And, uh, that's right. But, but were they screwed up? Because it wasn't a grand plan. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure the NCAA's ever had a grand plan for anything, except. Uh, and I'm talking about NCAA. That's that is Ohio State. That is Michigan. It is you know, it's not just a castle over in Indianapolis. Uh, where they where they where they screwed up was, is it came around to where states made laws allowing, you know, uh, players, student athletes to 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 take part in name, image, and likeness, not rules which can be changed from one year to the next when it, now all of a sudden they're fighting a lot. Now they're looking for Congress to bail them out and uh, with guardrails as they keep calling them and stuff, you know, and this freeway has already been built and you're trying to put guardrails on it. Now it's kind of funny. To, you're holding up traffic when you do that. Right. I mean, it's. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and now they're, they're getting after this transfer portal thing. It's, it's the best thing that ever happened to these kids. Yeah. You know, wh wh when you, when you say that coaches can't transfer, then okay. If no one can transfer, that's fine. Right? Yes. But as long as you're letting coaches transfer, as long as you're letting trainers and athletic tra directors transfer, then you got to let the, these kids transfer. You know, most of these careers, and this is what people need to understand, most of these careers are going to be extraordinarily short. Right? I mean, 90% of them, whatever the number is, 95% of them won't play in the NFL. Um, so while they have that, that brief period of potential productivity uh, and, and, you know, and fame, yeah. let, them, let them exploit it as much as they can. God bless yeah. them. Yeah. And uh, anytime there's a big change, as you know, this just, I call it the orogeny. Orogeny is when, when, you know, is when earth, when 
tectonic plates run into each other and all this kind of stuff and mountains are formed or chasms are formed or whatever any kind of any kind of like a living uh being goes through or you know uh you know organization goes through these things where all of a sudden there's a tectonic shift is maybe what i should have said there in the first place so people didn't think we we're going down a weird path but uh but this tectonic shift is going on right now it's obvious to everybody it should have been available to guys like you and before you but dude the money really took off when television started pumping it in and when nike for example started uh sponsoring uh coaches uh, players teams programs etc and that's when there should have been like you said a reckoning of all right wait a minute now this wasn't happening in 1950 or 1908 1975 what are we going to do now but they didn't do it like you said they the money just kept coming in you know kind yeah. of like the government hey. Or we're going to come yeah. up with another program to spin it. Go ahead now. <laughs> and for people who should have known better and, and yes. did know better, I, yes. I would argue that they did know better and they still did the evil thing, which in my mind, frankly, makes them evil. That's yeah. just an, an evil approach. Yeah. Uh, other, otherwise, you have no opinion. No, I'm just joking. Hey, uh, well, what do, you, what do you think should be the thing now? Mike, you should, you know, before you go here, but should should players be sharing uh you know, obviously, the NCAA now is having a, uh, as we speak, is basically, I think, at a convention where they're deciding on minimum, um, possibly thirty thousand uh, dollars a player for, you know, for big time college football players and maybe basketball players, you know, men's and women's probably. But uh, that's that's not a that's not a drop in the bucket. That's a pretty good drop. You know what I mean? For uh, for but but not every program is going to be able to afford that aspect of it either, based on but. But it, do you do you sense they are moving in the right direction in in that regard? At least yeah, come I mean, into grips with what is in front of them. But do they really truly have a grip on it? I guess is my yeah. Point. So so you know, l let me just have the put this disclaimer out there. I'm not following it very closely, so I don't yeah. have I know any but... detailed information or inside information. What I would say is that the NIL scheme that is in place today is inadequate to satisfy the long-term success of college football, right? So yeah. you'll always have an element of some NIL because some kids are just going to have more, more fame. Um, they're going to have a you know, more ability to generate revenue for their advertisers, their sponsors, whatever the case might be. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's inevitable in my mind to have some level of fairness across the board for all the programs around the country. The, the TV revenue is going to have to be divvied up in some way. It's going to yeah. have to come out of TV revenue. And, and, and I know the colleges and universities are going to resist that. Um, they're, they're going to fight as hard as they've ever fought against anything uh, because that's that's what's funding a lot of their other stuff. But I think if they look at it from a very different perspective, everyone's going to be better off. You know, a rising tide will lift all boats. And so even, you know, some of the, the non-revenue um, non-revenue sports that Ohio State carries or other universities carry, they will be better better off. Uh, and it will all work out in the end. Everyone just needs to to take a deep breath and say, what's the right thing to do, not only for the programs that they're representing, but more importantly, for the kids that are playing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's still stunning to some people, for example, that uh, when you play football at a big time university, your health care uh, doll, your health care expenses aren't necessarily all taken care of. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, the First thing they do is they look at your own family's, uh, at least they have, they look at your own family's medical situation, you know, uh, medical uh, insurance situation, et cetera, at least they have in the past. And they're they're moving slowly but surely toward that. But, but just basic stuff, you know, forget about how much money, you know, you should be getting a month or, or a year. Just basic stuff should be covered, right? When you put when you put your knees on the line for good old you. Yeah, and, and you're right. I mean, they, they always did expect um, family insurance to cover part or or even perhaps all of your medical expenses. Now, I, I had a great experience at Ohio State. I actually did spend about a week and a half in uh, in the hospital. Um, I had a, ca a bad case of, of mono. And, yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and the university, God bless them, they stepped up. I have nothing but good good things to say about the university in my particular situation and uh, and specifically Billy Hill, uh, may he rest in peace. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> our athletic trainer for a long, long time, whose son, by the way, is a uh, an 06 in the Air Force, as we oh, said. Yeah. And he um, went to Air Force Academy. Actually, 
actually he might even he might even have even made 07 i'm not sure yet but anyway um yeah so you know there are schools like ohio state that do the right thing you know pretty much all the time right and then there are and then there are other schools and you know i can't speak to the other schools and how they treat their their student athletes you know i i know ohio state does a good job they did a good job in the past i i know they do a good job now uh, but that's not true of all of all colleges and universities so yeah. you know we we need to make sure that there is at least a a safety net for some of these kids who don't have the resources whose families don't have the resources to come up with the potentially thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of medical bills that they might run into. And then we have to take a look at what happens after they play. You know, in the military, if I have a what they call a service-connected injury, in other words, an injury that resulted from you know, my service in the military, then the VA will pick up my expenses for my lifetime, essentially, as long as the injury would last, uh, and they would continue to cover my medical, exp ex medical expenses um, for the purposes of that particular injury. Yeah. We need, we need to move to something like that in, in the college world. The NFL has kind of, I, I don't really understand the NFL system all that well, but they've got some of it covered in some ways and they expect it to go on workers comp. Um, so, you know, there, there's gotta be some, some plan or program or initiative around taking care of kids that get hurt. And I'm not just talking about from now forward, but I, I mean, even going backwards and saying, I agree. you know, how do we take care of the folks that really took care of us, that put people in the seats of those stadiums? How do we take care of the ones that that have lifelong injuries? Yeah. You know, and you've seen kids um, with debilitating, career-ending injuries. And you know, if if they were in, in the NFL, they would be treated differently from how they're treated at the collegiate level. Yeah. So yeah, don't just don't just depend on GoFundMe situations. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Hey, uh, real quick. Uh, uh, what 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 is the biggest difference <clears throat> from your vantage point in the game today? The actual game today compared to when you played, and y'all had an outstanding lineup. You know, with well, like I said, Keith Byers, who should have won the Heisman that year. He claims he did. He did win it. That Doug Flutie's just keeping it for him. You know what I'm talking about. But. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the biggest difference you see in the game right now? Has it gotten even faster? How would you describe it to somebody if you were, uh, cause you were in the midst of it. Uh, yeah. I mean, at the highest level. I think kids specialize a lot earlier today in a way that we never did. And I, yeah. I, I, I don't get, that's not a good thing. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, we played at least three sports, you know, in my situation, I played football in the fall. I wrestled in the winter and, and I ran track in, in the spring and I didn't know anybody on our team that didn't play at least, you know, two sports. Yeah. Uh, and Keith, Keith Byers, I mean, he excelled at everything in high school, you know, yeah. great basketball player, um, you know, wonderful track athlete. And and kids don't do that today. Uh, you know, I, I've threatened my wife a couple of times. I'm, I'm going to write a book on, on kids sports, youth sports, because it is just out of control. Um, you, you know, so that's one of the big differences. Kids just start specializing so much earlier do they end up becoming better football players as a result of that, of that specialization? I don't know. Whatever they gain in the specialization, they lose in overall athleticism and yeah. not just the physical attributes of athleticism, but the overall um, mental aspects. You know, for example, I, I was a wrestler. I, I was a very, very mediocre, mediocre wrestler in high school. I love wrestling though, because it taught me so much about individual competition. When you wrestle, it's just you and your opponent out of the mat. Yeah, and, and it's, it's not tactics, a team sport. right? Yeah, it's, it's tactics. Not, and, it, and, and it's it's about you know your character at the end of the day. Yeah. What kind of person are you? Are you are, are you going to throw in the towel or are you going to fight? Even if you lose, are you going to fight? And, and you know, I think when kids specialize in one sport, whether it be football, basketball, baseball, whatever, I think they lose that cross cross sport competitiveness and um, and then there's all the physical stuff. But I you know, I don't really understand all that much that the the trainers could tell you but you know being able to 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 move among different sports especially at a young age is so important for their physical and emotional and intellectual well-being and and we just don't do it anymore so that's the biggest change i think yeah and you you can learn you can learn all kinds of things you know from playing different sports that help you in the other sports like you're talking about exactly just, like i brought exactly. up tactics i mean you know wrestling's all about tactics because you go in with a strategy but then 
the other guy has one too, right? As the old saying goes, yeah. you go in with a strategy against Mike Tyson, but as soon as he hits you in the face, well, now what are you going to do, right? Yeah, and uh, exactly. Buster Douglas figured that out. Uh, but uh, but the bottom line is, yeah, I mean, I, there are all, all kinds of merits for all that. Plus, you don't just end up straining, you know, and this is a euphemism, straining one muscle all the time. You know, you're, <clears throat> you know what I mean? You're using different things for, for different sports, et cetera. I wanted to ask yep. you this. Uh, um, it has nothing to do with that. What was the greatest benefit you got from being a Rhodes Scholar? I'm not, you know, this isn't, I'm trying to keep this short because you're under deadline, but uh, what, what, I mean, that was back in the day. Here was Michael Nice, a star football player, and you were a star football player. You can take a bow, but doom, bam, all of a sudden you're going to England as a Rhodes Scholar, uh, which showed you there was more to it than just the football aspect of things. I think in the last several years, what's been got, what's been forgotten is anything to do with academics. Nobody, we don't even bring that up anymore. You know what I mean? When, when we're talking about players and stuff, unless they do something really extraordinary, but uh, what is, you know, number yeah, one, I mean, how'd, you, how'd you become a road scholar and what was the greatest benefit you got from that? Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, again, I, I have to look at, at Ohio State. I mean, I, I had such a great experience at Ohio State. Yeah. And, and not not just in the football program, um, but in the academic world as well. And, you know, maybe because there were some advantages uh, to being in the football program, I got introduced. That, that's probably the, the biggest advantage. Yeah. The introductions and the networking and the connections I was able to make throughout the rest of the university. So one of the guys I, I got introduced to relatively early, and thank God I did, was a guy called Wick Murray, Professor Williamson Murray um, in the military history department. And he really turned me on to living a life that was um, a little bit different from you know what I ex experienced in, in, in the past, um, an intellectual life, a life of books and ideas. And that was something that, that really changed my orientation uh, going forward. And then Herb Asher stepped in and you know, yeah. David Front stepped in um, and, and I was exposed to things that, that I, I'd never, I'd never seen before and, and ways of thinking that I hadn't ever considered before. And so that was the start. Uh, and then, you know, going, going to England, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a, not a huge fan of, of England, the country. I, I love, I, I love the people, uh, that, you know, the country, uh, I'm not a big fan of, of miserable weather and, you know, uh, yeah. that's what you get. Hell like we're having today. And, Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. That's what you get in England. But, um, and the food isn't so good either. But, uh, you know, I was surrounded by people who were elite in what they were doing. And I, I, I was just happy to be there. You know, I was meeting folks and my close circle of friends were from around the world. And I'm still friends with many of them today. In fact, I just had a conversation with somebody uh, uh, who's a, a Japanese diplomat. And we're still very close to this day. Wow. Uh, I met at Oxford. So, you know, it, it, it was an experience that it was, you know, able to shape who I was to become at an intellectual level. And um, I will be forever grateful for that opportunity. Yeah. I mean, you met people from around the world, but who were like-minded, right? I mean, from the standpoint of curious, wanting to know, uh, it's, I mean, that. that yeah. And, and let me, let me just put a fine point on, on that. They were like-minded in the sense that everyone was, was considering the world of ideas but yes they were they were not all the same and we thought differently and that yeah. was another huge advantage to being in that environment to, to understanding that someone else thought differently um, th than I did or my yeah. close circle of friends did and understanding those differences not only at the surface level but understanding how they arrived at, at, at those ideas and, and yeah. decisions yeah that's what I meant by like-minded like-minded. I mean, doesn't mean you all, you know, we're sitting here at a, a pep rally and we're, you know, <clears throat> you know, I'm, oh, man, it, I'm not, cause you got to go. I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but we're, we're, we're in a world with a lot of rabbit holes. <laughs> uh, hey, Mike, let's think why, why the military? I mean, I've never, you know, you and I haven't talked in a while, but w what was it a, a specifically about the military that intrigued you because man, I had you pegged. Remember, you even told me, man, uh, uh, make sure I got some kind of back or some kind of like uh, uh, education on basically being a PR guy. Because you and I talked about one time me even being your spokesman. I don't know if you don't even remember that, but when you ran for governor or something like that, and 
Because I, I really, I really enjoyed my conversations with you back then. I mean, you don't remember any of that because of the, all the hits you took in football, I'm sure. But uh, I'm I'm glad it never got to that because I would have been a poor spokesman. I would have gotten you in more hot water mm -hmm. than than gotten you out of the bathtub, if you know what I'm saying. But uh, but why why did you? What was what was it about the military? Was, was it because you could make a difference? You felt? I mean, you know what I mean? What was the intrigue? Yeah, I mean, not not to 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 get too deep into it, but it, it it's something that everyone who serves in the military has to come to uh, by him or herself, and it's just a a level of service to something much yeah. bigger than yourself. Yeah, um, it's it's the way in which I can contribute. There are other ways to contribute, but this is the way that I think um, I am, for whatever reason, you know, intellectually and physically able to do, and so. Um, you know, when I look at myself in the mirror every morning and, and I say, yep, I'm in the right place. Um, and I didn't say that when, when, when I left the, the Navy uh, and had that long, you know, 15 year break in service, um, I would wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm not sure I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be on a ship somewhere in the South China Sea, or I'm supposed to be somewhere, um, you know, in, in Africa uh, serving. And um, yeah. you know, it's an individual choice. And I, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I I definitely put my recruiting hat on in a lot of occasions. I'm not I'm not going to lie about that. I I think there are certain people who uh, who are, are are destined to serve or would be great leaders in the military. But you know, ultimately, it's an individual decision. And, and let's face it, the older I get, and like I said, when I was a kid, I didn't really appreciate all all of the things that could go wrong. Um, but you know, now that I'm older, I'm I'm a little wiser, I think. And yeah. You know, I think for some people, it still makes a lot of sense. And you have to look look internally. You have to look at your your individual circumstance and, you know, your, who you are as a person and, and decide whether that that's a life that you want to lead. Yeah. Well, man, I give it up to you because I, I just think uh, people in the service are just uh, in some in some respects underappreciated, sometimes underestimated and uh, should have more of a say in the way some things go down until we and, you know, instead of us getting to a vol a volatility point, you know, to where you have to act. You understand what I'm saying? Because I think the people who have been in the service know better than anybody else of what it means to what happens when you have to act, right? I mean, it is no turning back. It's uh, when it all, not when it all costs, but when is what you're all about. And uh, uh, I'm, I know I'm, I'm stammering here because you, there are so many hot spots in the world right now as we speak it's crazy kind of what we're on the verge of maybe unless cooler heads prevail. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to get into any, any of that. Um, all, all I'll say is that, you know, service is a privilege and um, it's something that, uh, that I think is right for me. And, you know, everyone has to kind of look at the mirror and, and, and see whether it's right for them. Yeah. There you go. He, uh, ladies and gentlemen, he's in the he's in the military, so he can't really make a comment. Is what he was trying to say there, Mike Lanise. I'm your spokesman, and uh, I want to say you're one of the great guys I've ever ran into. And we're going to do this again on one of these days. We're going to be more specific about a few more things, uh, more specific about the Pacific. <laughs> hey, 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 Tim, I want to say one thing about Nick Saban. So yeah, oh yeah. Uh, well, that's that's the reason I called you in the first place because I saw the the letter. Go ahead. Yeah, so I put a letter on the internet. So my mom literally saved every recruiting letter, every poster, whatever I got during that, yeah. that crazy period of recruiting, which again is something that's totally different today. The recruiting process is yeah. insane. Wait, wait, um, wait, you know, you didn't demand $5,000 just to come make an official visit? Go ahead now. Yeah. That's what's going on, baby. Uh, God bless them if they can if they can get the five thousand dollars. But yeah. Um, so when Nick said just a, a quick quick story, when Nick Saban came to my house, he was sick as a dog. He had the flu or something. And um, you know, my mom being a, a kind of a traditional Italian American mom, um made him lie down on the couch <laughs> and, and she whipped up her homemade soup and wouldn't let him leave until he was feeling better and well enough to drive back to Columbus. Uh, and I saw him years later and, you know, introduced myself again. He said, yeah, I remember, how's your mom doing? You know, she, she really hooked him up. Um, but it was a great, yeah, a great experience. And, you know, I don't know Nick that well. I know him you know, to say hello, uh, but you got to put him up there as, you know, potentially the greatest college football coach ever. Yeah. Um, and you know, as, as many of the great college football coaches do that he he's got, 
some Ohio State DNA in him. So. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, you know, he got fired from Ohio State, I think, during during the period, because you were a freshman in 80. 80- Eighty-two. So yeah. he got fired during my recruiting period. So correct. What? So what did you think about that? I I didn't know what to think. All of a sudden, I got a call, and this might have been a few weeks before the signing date, when the the signing date mattered. Yeah. Um. And I got a call from a guy called Randy Hart. Yeah. Keep this uh, and, Yeah. And Randy said, uh, "Hey, I'm I'm your new new recruiter." And I said, "What what happened to Coach Saban?" He said, "Well, you don't need to worry about that." And uh, you know, for, for me, it was more about obviously the institution of Ohio State, and um, you know, people who knew me back then knew that I, I was I was headed towards Michigan. I mean, I was all but committed to go to Michigan, um, and you know, just because of guys like Nick Saban, Randy Hart, you know, Earl Bruce, God God bless him, um, yeah. you know, because of those guys, I ended up making the right decision. You know, yeah. and I'm not saying that people who go to Michigan Michigan you know, make the wrong decision. I, I think it's, you know, there, there are better life choices to make um, than to go to Michigan. But if you do, you know, <laughs> they're, God, they're, God, yeah, God, yeah, good luck. It was like you and Spillman. Spillman was right there with Michigan too. You know what I mean? And then he ends up uh, going to Ohio state and of course, Michigan stinks. Right. But I mean, um, but it, that, that is, I mean, you're seeing it right now that, that, that decision is so can be so life changing in so many ways. Did you, you did you realize that even back then as a 17, 18 year old about, did you ever think past where am I, how am I going to compete, compete as a running back at Ohio state? Did you ever think past, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, what this decision will mean for me other than football? Yeah. I mean, part, part of being 17 is that you are incapable of making those kinds of Correct. decisions like, like that. Yeah. So yeah, no one knows. And despite what you hear from people, despite all the best advice you get, you know, some people still go to Michigan. So yeah. Go figure. And back then, you know, schools were stockpiling players and stuff. And like you said, the transfer portal is one of the great things that's ever happened because guys do make mistakes or guys do kind of yeah. get sold a bill of goods and all of a sudden they get there and the line. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll just tell you, one, you know, one quick story. So when I, when I came in as a freshman, um, we didn't have ESPN. We didn't have, you know, all that 24 hour sports. I had no idea who else they recruited to go to Iowa yeah. State my freshman yeah. year. And so I was an all-state tailback, but there were like five or six all-state tailbacks coming in um, <laughs> to Ohio State that, that freshman year, including a guy called Keith Byers. And yeah. my right hand to God, I swear, I swear to God, I met Keith at the freshman camps. We used to have a freshman camp, you know, a couple about a week earlier, a couple of days earlier than, than the rest of the folks came in. Yeah. And I, I, I met this guy and I said, so what position do you play? And he said, I play tailback. I looked at him and I said, yeah. "Oh my God, I, I made I made the, a bad decision." So, uh, but it all worked out, and uh, you know things as things hey, tend to do, they work out. And we, you know, I, when I he asked you what position did you play, did you say scat back? <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't know what what to think at that point. I, I was I'd never seen a guy that big that fast before ever. Yeah. Hey, one last thing. If you could make a recommendation right now about college athletics, about about the transfer portal, NIL tie-in, which you knew was going to happen, Southern schools uh, were waiting for this. You know, this was their this was their uh, Independence Day when this all came down a couple of years ago and stuff of being able to tie this with that. Oh my goodness, what you got right? And uh, what what what? Just like you said, you don't pay attention to this every day, every minute. But what is one thing you would change about things right now if you could, if you had that magic wand? I'd like to ask guys like you that question who were went through it in the good old days and paid it have paid attention to a certain extent. But what would you change right now that could bring some, I don't know, uh order to the chaos to a certain extent? I mean, chaos is good because yeah, a lot of times chaos, say, good I, things come out of chaos. Go ahead. I I, I don't find the current situation, as chaotic as it is, I don't find it to be problematic. In fact, I think it's kind of exciting, right? Yeah. I mean, now you don't only, only have this single recruiting period where you're looking at college seniors and maybe or, or high school seniors and high school juniors or whatever. You've got the full range of folks that might have a difficult situation at their current university. They might want to transfer. They, it just makes things makes things so much more interesting and exciting. So for college football overall, I know there are lots of folks wringing their hands about the state of the state of the game and where it's going. 
But for right now, things are are, are pretty cool. I mean, let let let's find out where this leads. Um, ultimately, there has to be some some kind of tie back to the university, right? You, yeah. you have to be student athletes at some level. You have to have a university attachment uh, to 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 the world of college sports. Um, and by the way, it's different. We, the way we do things in the U.S. is not like anywhere else in the world. Yeah. And so I think it's unique and, and unique in a very good way. So keep that um, keep that momentum, keep keep that model as long as possible and and find ways to tweak it, just shape it. But let it let it take on a life of its own. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, though. But coaches are really maybe they're still not earning, you know, their eight or 10 or 12 million dollars a year. But they're still they're earning their money more than ever, because, like you said, they're recruiting high school players. When those high school players show up, they're recruiting them to stay you know, or urging them you're to always leave. recruiting, right? Yeah. You're always recruiting. It is 24 seven. Now as, a, as yep. your friend, uh, Jim Trussell once said, uh, missing a day of missing a day of recruiting is like missing a day of shaving. You end up looking like a bum, you know, and, uh, you know, and he coached you by the way. And real quick before you go, it, it's amazing that, uh, you and I were talking before we started here, this guy still remembers almost everybody's name. How many guys did he coach over the years and stuff? If you could tell people one thing that stood out about Jim Trussell, to you, even back then, it rings true today. What is it? Yeah, I, I'd say two things. Number one, he's the smartest coach I've ever been around. You know, just a really smart guy in a lot of different areas. Um, and, and the second thing is that you know, he's the only coach I had that uh, that really got got under my skin. He knew exactly how to get to how to motivate me. Yeah. Um, and he was a Cleveland guy, you know, and I think Cleveland guys kind of kind of flock together a little bit. He understood who I was, where I came from. And he would do some stuff to make me so angry, but it made me a much better football player. Yeah. Yeah. The essence of coaching. It ain't always putting your arm around a guy, tell him how great he is. You got to know your players. Right? Nick Saban, man, he was a genius at that. Urban Meyer was a genius at that, you know, in, in another way. But uh, anyway, Mike Lanise, man, let's do this again, man. I, I totally enjoyed this. I, you have more thoughts and you uh, let, let on there about some things. And, uh, and I'm not surprised by that whatsoever. Uh, Mike Lanise, thanks for joining the Tim May show. All right, Tim, great to talk to you. Pardon this interruption, but I did want to get this message to you, folks. Uh, the GameTime app, GameTime.co, that's the place to go, especially if you put off buying tickets to maybe one of the hottest sporting events in Columbus this winter. Yes, that's right. The Iowa women are coming to town with Caitlin Clark to take on the ranked Ohio State Buckeyes. It's on uh, January the 21st in the Schottenstein Center. And right now, the Cheapest get-in price on Game Time app, GameTime.co, is two hundred and fifty-six dollars. That's a hell of a deal. And uh, if you promise that certain loved one of yours, be it male or female, that you're going to take them to see one of the one of the one of the great athletes uh, of, of current times, that's Caitlin Clark, to play against the Buckeyes. Now's the time to act. And remember, if you download the Game Time app, and if you use the Game Time app and you use the promo code. Buckeyes, you'll get $20 off that first purchase, $20 off that first purchase. Uh, and uh, if you find a ticket on the Game Time app or GameTime.co and it's cheap, if you find a ticket there, purchase it, and then you find another ticket for cheaper price in the same row, same same general section, uh, you'll get 110% of the difference back uh, from Game Time, the GameTime.co. Remember, as always, uh, terms do apply. But Game Time app, GameTime.co, that's the place to go for your last-minute tickets or your plan ahead tickets, maybe for the U.S. Figure Skating Championships, which are coming coming to Columbus uh, next week. The Game Time app, GameTime.co, that's the place to go. Yeah, Pete, you saw. I mean, uh, uh, Michael Anise is a quite impressive dude, matter-of-fact kind of guy. You know, if he wasn't so hell-bent on being in the military, he'd be the kind of guy that if you're looking for a czar of – Big time major college football now, which I think we're headed that way sooner rather than later. That would be the kind of guy I'd look at. I mean, I'd look outside the box, you know, uh, and uh, go with a guy who can who thinks things through and it doesn't always come up with the answer you think he's going to have. You know, when he talked about how you know he's for the NIL, and uh, this is a guy that came from the you know the the hard scrabble times. <laughs> pardon the expression <laughs> of the 1970s and eighties and stuff. When, if you got a, if somebody bought you a cheeseburger, you know, it was against the rules, right? My cheeseburger reference there. I got it. Jim Harbaugh, it. et cetera. But, uh, 
but the bottom line is, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a guy that can think outside the box and uh, and 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 look at it from the player's point of view, which I really enjoyed that conversation. But let's get rid to it before you have to go here now. Uh, Ohio State, I've been contending on radio, TV, on this platform, uh, and even writing that Ohio State, uh, yeah, Michigan won a game in January that won two games in January that won at the national championship. But Ohio State, if this matters at all, and I think it does, is quickly winning the month of January uh, like never before. What's your take on that, Pete? Yeah, you know, um, there's like transfer portal rankings and all that stuff and Louisville and Ole Miss and Texas A&M have had great months. But the way Ohio State approaches the portal, I think the portal has given them everything they've looked for, right? Uh Instead of building a roster through the portal, Ohio State has used it to fine tune and maybe even um, push it up up into another echelon of of I don't know favorites to win the national title next year. Um, yeah. But yeah, the way Ryan Day and his staff have been able to use it, and I mean, Will Howard's a Buckeye, and I, I think that's probably the best quarterback fit Ohio State was going to find in the portal outside of maybe a Riley Leonard. But there's a lot more to unpackage with that one, and then. Yep. Um, you get Travion Henderson to come back and then you add probably the best running back in college football for the one, two punch with them. I mean, it, as long as the, the, the offensive line is in place, I, I mean, I know Will Howard has a great arm, but I don't know how much you're going to need him to throw the ball. And then, I mean, we could rave on and on about what that defense is going to look like next year with all the starters coming back. Yeah. You know, that's why I keep telling everybody, man, for major college head coaches, you're recruiting all the time and you're recruiting everybody all the time. I mean, you know, yeah. this, uh, this idea, and you've heard me and Spencer Holbrook and, and uh, Andy Backstrom talk about this. I've talked about it on all the platforms I'm on uh, this idea that Ohio, that Ryan Day lost his locker room. Well, look at that locker room today. I mean, everybody almost that matters is back on defense, except for the guys who basically graduated, you know, he did not lose the locker room. Tim. <laughs> Did not lose the locker room. I mean, crazy that people just come up with these bad answers because they got beat 14 to three by Missouri. Uh, and then they didn't have a quarterback. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. then they get the quarterback that really fits. Ryan Day understands it better than anybody. You got to have a guy that not, not only can run, but will run. Right. Yeah. They got that in Will Howard. I mean, you know, bless his heart, Cal McCord. I wish him all the best. But golly, you got to have a guy that will go, man, and yep. uh, because it just opens everything else up. I mean, we, you know, uh, even C.J. Stroud finally saw the light about that. Maybe a little bit too late, uh, but he definitely saw it against Georgia, and now he's going to be at least, you know, ro offensive rookie of the year, maybe rookie of the year in the National Football League because he will even run now in the NFL when it calls for him. My point is, and then you go out and get Quinshawn Judkins. Maybe as tough a back as there was in the in the Southeastern Conference the last two years, but you're teaming him up with Travion Henderson, so you don't have to run Quinshawn Judkins like Ole Miss did almost into the ground, you know. Yeah. And uh, and then right on down the line, they've gotten the part. Seth McLaughlin, yeah, yep. he's gonna he's gonna remember for a lot of those bad snaps, but he's also gonna be remembered as being a starter at Alabama for a couple of years, probably stepping into that center role. We'll see if they move him to guard. Uh, we'll see where that goes with Carson Hensman being disciplined for that uh, Cotton Bowl, even though they didn't name it that way. We'll see if he's back at center. But uh, but they got parts that really fit. Yeah. And that's what stands out about Ohio State in the portal. Uh, it, that and the fact that they kept guys from leaving, talked guys into not leaving. And that's what it says about Ohio State and maturing, not as all, all the way there, but the maturing of its name, image, and likeness situation, right? Yeah, and I guess the other thing that is worth highlighting, too, is, right, like, you talk about losing the locker room, and obviously that's not correct, but, I mean, how many guys on the, on the defensive side of the ball? Is it is it 10? I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. It might be less than that, but my point is they obviously have confidence in Ryan Day and Jim Knowles and Larry Johnson and James Laurinaitis and Tim Walton that – they're going to be developed and, and only boost their draft stock and right on it. And they put their faith in the coaching staff that, Hey, like we're going to get things right on the offensive side of the ball. And we're going to go win the big 10 title for the first time in four years. And we're going to go make the national title game. And um, I think it says a lot about all those guys and their confidence in the coaching staff yeah. to make the bet to, to not the bet, the gamble, the comeback. Um, 
and 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 try to win at Ohio State. That's what I was talking about about recruiting. You you have to keep recruiting the guys you have anymore. You know, tell me Caleb DeBoer in in going. Wait a minute, I inherited this this roster replete with four and five stars, and now you're seeing a lot of those become shooting stars. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, the I, I other know. thing you have to do too now as a coach is you also have to like still be nice to the high school recruits who pass up on you. Yeah. There's a chance you're going to get them in the portal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You never know who you're going to get coming or going, you know, and yep. uh, that to me is the most incredible part about being a, a major college head coach anymore. It's like crazy. Let me ask you this from your vantage point. How much did the NIL situation at Ohio State, as I call it a maturing situation at Ohio State, how much did it help keep, some of these guys from going to the national football league. I think all these guys are hell bent on coming back and winning a big 10 title and beating Michigan and going to the college football playoff and possibly winning it. That's definitely driving uh, the main driving force, but how much did the uh, NIL situation in Ohio state help in that regard from your vantage point? You know, I think in the last like six to 12 months or or, or so, I think, I mean, I think Ohio State's always had a strong NIL operation, but with some new collectives and, and things like that, I think they've really vaulted into the like tier one of NIL organization, collectives, programs, oh. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that uh, having knowing that there is going to be strong financial packages like there are all across the country, that if they if they made the decision to return to school, that they were obviously going to. Uh, be taken care of and 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 sign a strong NIL deal. And um, I mean, that's what all the top programs are doing now too. People love to yell about pay for play and inducements and things like that. And I mean, the NCAA just came down with its first violation about NIL last week. I mean, everyone's doing it. Uh, I had a source tell me last week, like, we're not going to stop doing it because everyone else is doing it. And, and we just can't, uh, can't fall behind. Yeah. You just can't be so blatant, overt about it. You know what I mean? I mean, um, I think Florida State found that out the hard way. Yeah. And their, uh, what, their offensive coordinator, can't remember who the guy. Uh, Alex Atkins. Al Alex Atkins, yeah. Wow, yeah. Just, see, we will get you for speeding, but they can only get one car at a time, you know, while everybody else is going 90. You went yeah. 92. Uh-oh. <laughs> you got pulled over. Uh, yeah. That's life. Hey, uh, one last quickie. Uh, did – the fact they got Will Howard, was that uh, Ohio State, when you looked at it from an NIL standpoint, what is just your guess on from a NIL package deal that Will Howard could enjoy uh, going into this season? What do you think that's worth to him? What have you, you know, guys in on three come up with? I, I haven't checked their evaluation recently, and I don't have an exact number for Will Howard, but I, what I can tell you, Tim, is – the Nebraska head coach, Matt Rule, made the statement in late yeah. November that an elite transfer quarterback costs between one and one point five million, two million. And I think that's probably right on the dart. That's what Cam Ward's gonna get at Miami. That's what Riley Leonard's gonna get at Notre Dame. And I'd have to imagine that's what Ohio State will pay Will Howard. Yeah. And uh who knows what kind of endorsements he'll pick up as the season goes on if things right. go the way a, a lot of people think this Ohio State offense can go. Um Last question for you. Um, is Remember last time I had you on, we were talking about, I was talking about the chaos aspect of mm -hmm. everything that's going on now. Uh, yeah. Is it only going to get more stirred up? What is your, from your vantage point, what do you see in the next couple of years? Is there any, is anything, because I always said you had to give this two years just to see how the lay of the land was, right? See how, yeah. the, how choppy the seas would get. But what do you see? Well, right. I mean, a, a lot's changed since we last talked, right? Charlie Baker uh, released a memo outlining like a new subdivision of sports where schools would pay athletes. Uh, the NCAA is going to try to move that forward. I continue to see revenue sharing being a thing. Um, I continue to think that that the college football playoffs should break off and, and form their own league for college football. Um but I don't think a lot's going to change in the short term, right? Like if you thought this transfer portal window was crazy with NIL and stuff, like I'm hearing crazy things about what the spring's going to be like for that two week window, because schools are going to take the next, what, I don't know, like four yeah. months to, yeah. to, to think about 
man, I really need an offensive tackle. And they're going to have time to call their donor and say, hey, I need like half a million dollars or something. Like I expect the spring to be pure chaos because it's only two weeks. Yeah. Well, can he can he endorse ABC root beer? You know, if he can, maybe we got a deal for him. You know what I mean? <laughs> there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Pete Nakos, who's become a a star in this business. I I knew you back when when I bought you dinner one one night over in Indianapolis. Do you remember that, Pete? I do remember that well, Tim. And boy, you have come a long way from that dinner, Mexican. I appreciate dinner. that. You're welcome, though, man. Anytime. Muy bueno, mi amigo. Uh, <laughs> But uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's Pete Nakos. I enjoyed Michael Nice joining me for the first time ever on the Tim May Show. Uh, he's a, a fellow I had a great relationship with when he was a player at Ohio State, and now you know why. And, uh, boy, who knows what the next week's going to bring in college football. But until then, until next week, we'll see you then. Thanks so much, Tim.